praying series, and remember last week, and if, if you missed last week, catch up online, but if you remember, we said we're calling this series Praying, uh, because we don't want to just talk about prayer, we want to be a praying people, right? Uh, this is a hallmark of the Christian life, it's, it's something that is a foundational concept in our relationship with Jesus, but I've learned as a pastor, and as a parent, and, and just in life, that it's dangerous to assume anything. Have you ever noticed that? It's dangerous to assume anything. Like, for instance, as a pastor, if I assume, man, everybody in our, oh, everybody in our church knows how to pray. Or everybody in, anybody that knows Jesus knows how to pray. Man, we know that's a big, faulty assumption. And so I just want to kind of release you today from, from if you're like, man, I, I come, but I have no idea what I'm doing in the Christian life. Hey, you're in the right place. And, and I really mean it when I say that life's too short not to enjoy church. And we want this to be a place where you grow and know how to take next steps. And where God isn't just somebody that we talk about, but he goes from your head to your heart. And it becomes a real relationship. Why? Because it's not about religion. It's about a relationship that you can have with Jesus Christ. And so whether you're in the room today or whether you're watching online, man, we're so thankful that you joined us. And if you want to open your Bibles, open your apps, uh, do whatever you got to do to get ready. Uh, there's some notes in your seats here today. If you're watching online, you can go to the Mosaic app. The notes are there. Uh, but yeah, grab your notes, grab the Word of God, and let's dig in. Today, the title of the message is Shape Me. And I don't know if there's a more dangerous, powerful prayer that you and I can pray than God, shape me, mold me. Back when I first started running, I just would go out and run, right? I didn't really know much about running. I just know that it felt good. And even when I was growing up, and my parents are here today, and, and I had the best place to grow up. Um, as far as like the house and the landscape, uh, our, our house was, was uh, right in front of woods that went on forever and ever and ever. And so as a boy, I would just run through the woods. One day, I, I don't know what was going through my head, but I got a hankering and I, I went all the way through the woods to a state park and back. And it was like 12 miles and it was just spontaneous. And I get back and I tell mama, mom, I just, I just went 12 miles and, um, and uh, it was just in me, right? But when you're a kid, you know, you're not thinking about nutrition. You're not thinking about, you know, what you need. You just go. You're like, de you're like dehydration, what's that? No big deal, right? But then you get older and you realize, I need stuff. And so um, I began, like, more seriously running in my late 30s. And, and on my th on, when I turned 30, right after I turned 30, I ran a marathon um, uh, for the first time. Uh, and it was actually on my daughter's birthday. So she was born that night, and I ran a marathon in the morning. And the doctor that delivered her was also in the race that morning. It was a crazy story. But one thing that I found out during that race is that my body really needs salt. Okay? And so I got to the end of the race, like around mile 22, and my calf starts locking up and cramping up like, like, a, like a rock. Right? And if you know anything about cramps, you know that you can't run if your muscle is cramping. Like, it's debilitating. And so here I am, mile 22, my mind was willing, but the body was weak. And I'm sitting on the side of the road trying to stretch this camp calf out. And for the last four miles of that race, I hobbled. Right? And so I figured out there's this key ingredient that my body needed to keep going, and it was salt. And so for all the races since then... I'm popping these salt tabs. I'm uh, so, some some race buddies that I was running with. They would cover skittles with salt, right? And so I'd be popping salty skittles, and that was just something that I needed, right? And I never knew that I needed it until I went far. And I really believe that prayer is to your spiritual life, like certain nutrients are to our physical bodies. And you never really know how much you need it or how lacking you are or how anemic you are in your faith when it comes to prayer until you go far in your spiritual walk. Far doesn't mean how long you've gone to church. Far doesn't mean that you've reached some spiritual level. Far just means you've lived life for a while and you come to that point where you realize you can't live life without Jesus. And maybe that's the reason that some of you are here today. You've realized you can't live life without Jesus. You've tried. You've tried to do it on your own, but you can't do it. Join the club. 
You see, the heart of prayer should be driven from a passion to know and to grow. To know Jesus and to grow in your relationship with Jesus. And knowing and growing starts with your posture towards growth. That's why we're calling today Shape Me. Because Shape Me is all about growing. You see, prayer without knowledge or scripture, which is the basis of what we're going to talk about today, prayer without knowledge and scripture is like food without nutrients. Nutrients. The word of God we're going to see today is like food for your prayer. It's like key nutrients that fuel your spiritual life. Some of you, when you diet, you know, you try to eat those uh, certain foods that don't have any nutrients so that you can lose fat. So that your belly is full, but you're losing pounds. Things like celery, things like lettuce. That really, there's not much there, but after you eat them, you feel like satisfied. But there's no nutrients. So, some of you are like, no, I'm a meat eater and, and I need more, right? Some people feel satisfied. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. Before long, when all your reserves are gone, those foods without nutrients won't last you any longer. You can feel full for a little while, but not be nutritious. And you can be eating food, but at the same time be anemic. Me and my wife and my kids, we love to watch this show called Alone. And maybe you've heard, it, heard me talk about it. But they throw these people out in the wilderness and they have to survive and just, just live off the land. And so I think it was in season six, this one guy for the first time in the history of the show took down big game. He took down a moose with a bow and arrow. And not like one of the bows and arrows that guys around here use, like a normal recurve bow and arrow. And so this was epic. He shoots the moose. The moose goes for a while. He has to wait for like three hours until the moose drops. Then he has to field dress this moose and get the meat back to camp before it, it gets dark, right? Because he's got to save the meat. Well, he gets the meat up on this platform to, to protect it from the animals. Lo and behold, wolverines can still get up on the platform and eat it. And guess what the wolverines ate? They ate all the fat. And so even though this guy had hundreds of pounds of moose meat, he was still losing weight like crazy. And 80 or 70 or 80 days later, he is in danger of being taken off the show due to weight loss, even though he has hundreds and hundreds of pounds of food. Can you imagine? He had plenty of food to eat, but he didn't have the right kind of food. He didn't have the nutrients to sustain his body and his weight. Your prayer life can be like that. You've got food. You're eating off what the world has to offer. You're eating off the things that, that maybe satisfy you for the short term, right? And you can even be praying, but still be starving spiritually. Why? Maybe it's because of your motives, and you can go back to last week's talk and listen to that. Maybe it's because of your focus. Maybe you're just praying weak, anemic prayers. Maybe it's selfishness. Maybe it's relationships that aren't made right in your life that are keeping your prayers from get, getting to heaven. Maybe it's religiosity. And what your spirit needs is high-nutrient food. You need some spiritual fat. That's going to keep you going. You need some healthy spiritual food, but you're binging on spiritual Twinkies. Your spiritual life is like body by hostess. You're eating and you're, you're full, but you're not healthy. So what's the way out? And this is where we're going to dig in today. What is the way out? It's praying the scripture. It's praying the scripture. And it's praying a prayer, God, shape me, no matter what it costs me, no matter what happens, shape me, mold me, help me to grow. Why? Because the word of God is, Hebrews chapter 4, 12, it's in your notes, it's the first verse we're going to look at today. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. It cuts between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes the innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing, everybody say nothing. 
Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And he is the one to whom we are accountable. He's the one to whom we are accountable. So what, what do we see? God's word is alive and powerful. It's sharp. It gets down deep where no one else can go. It gets between the soul and the spirit. Right? It exposes things. We're naked and exposed before God, and not physically, but spiritually. Like who we really are, he knows that. And then what does it say? We're accountable. Now, I've learned a lot the older I get, and one thing I know is it's really hard to grow when you're not accountable to somebody. And so this shape me prayer is so powerful because it means I'm going to be accountable to somebody so that I can grow, right? So that I can grow. And so these, these few things that happen when you, when you pray through the scriptures that we're going to talk about today, they don't happen in any particular order. Any one of these things can happen at any time. The scripture can do any one of them at any given time. And I hope and I pray that after today, you never use the excuse again in your whole life that you don't know what to pray. Have you ever thought that, God, I just don't know what to pray. I prayed for five minutes, and I prayed for, for my grandparents, and my kids, and my dog, and, and the fish, and, and I prayed for everything I know what to pray for. I don't know what else to pray. Right? And my prayer is that for after, after today, you never say that again, because you've got a whole Bible worth of things to pray about. Okay? Because the key to having a nutritious prayer life, a nutritious spiritual life, and to keep growing is the book that God has put in your hands, the scripture. And so let's dig in. You've got a whole book to pray. And when you pray the scripture, it number one, it shapes you. It shapes you. But to pray the scripture, you've got to be in the scripture. For it to shape you, you've, you've got to apply it to your life. The input really does determine the output in this, in this case. Man, have you ever seen those guys that shape things with with um, chainsaws or knives, you know, ice sculptures, or I just, me and my family just went down to the Smokies, and we saw, you know, those, those big, huge stumps that they would carve bears out of with, with chainsaws. How cool is that? And chisels, and, and, and it's so cool. Love that, right? Surgeons shape things. You know, these days, you can even, even go in and get your body shaped by a surgeon, and, and we have all these cool examples that we've seen with our eyes that illustrate what the scripture does to your heart. You see, when I read that verse, you know, it, it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It's sharper than the sharpest surgeon's scalpel. And it shapes you. But here's what we know about people with knives that want to cut stuff. Before they do work on you, whether it's the barber or the surgeon, you've got to get in the chair. You've got to get on the table. You've got to say, I'm going to go under the knife, right? Some of you hate going to the doctor. You hate going to the dentist. Anybody, people, anybody hate the dentist? It's like you're, just, you're nervous for days before you go because no one likes that. Why am I going to willingly go and sit in a chair and let that guy shove that needle in my mouth? It hurts. I just got a tooth yanked out a, a, a week or two ago. It's no fun. And in the same way, some of us are afraid to go to our spiritual surgeon and actually let him shape us. Because sometimes it hurts a little bit. But when we let the scripture shape us, some amazing things happen. Here's some great shaping prayers. You can pray Galatians 5.22 when it says, But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so someday you can pray this shaping prayer. God, I want your Holy Spirit to bear that kind of fruit in my life. God, I want, I want to be more loving to my family. God, I want, to be, I want to be more kind. I want to be more patient with my kids. God, I want goodness to flow out of my life. I want to be more faithful. I want to be a kind of person that others can count on. God, I want to be gentle. Give me self-control, Jesus, through the power of your Holy Spirit. I know that it doesn't come from me. It comes from you. You see, praying scripture, it's simple, but it's not easy. Because when you open up your heart to the spiritual surgeon, he's going to change your life. I love what it says in Psalm 1-1. This is another great shaping prayer. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers. 
but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They're like trees planted along the river, river bank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. I would just encourage you, pray that prayer. God, am I, am I hanging out with, with, you know, those that are wicked? Am I standing around with sinners too much? And don't get me wrong, Jesus ate with sinners. But he wasn't where the fruit came. They weren't where the fruit came from in his life. He planted himself at the foot of his father to really get his sustenance. How about Psalm 119? I encourage you sometimes, just go through that. Maybe take this whole week and just read chunks of Psalm 119. Why? Because all of Psalm 119 is a big prayer where the psalmist cries out to God, God, let me fall in love with your word. Let me fall in love with doing what pleases you. It's a shaping prayer, the whole entire psalm. How about John 15? It's another great shaping prayer, and I, I encourage you, write these down as we go through this. John 15 is a great shaping prayer. Listen to just this expert in verses 4 through 6. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. This is what Jesus is saying to us. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. God, I want to be fruitful. Yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. And anyone, and here's where the knife comes in. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered in a pile to be burned. We see throughout this passage that, that, that God's like the spiritual pruner. That he shapes you and molds you and he takes things out of your life and puts other things in your life. And, and he tends you. Why? Because he wants you to grow into his image. A great method that you can use to pray shape me prayers is the soap method. And each letter of the word soap stands for a different tool that you can use. The first one is scripture. And so maybe you commit to reading one chapter of your Bible every day. And as you read that one chapter, you highlight one scripture that just really jumps out to you. One verse. And then you write down, what do you observe about who, who God's talking to? And what are they saying? And what does it mean? And then number three, how are you going to apply it to your life? You write it down, and then number four, you pray that scripture into your life. Man, there's so many great shaping prayers in God's word. I encourage you to find some for yourself. Crack open God's word this week and find some shaping prayers to do the soap method with. The second thing that happens when we pray scripture over our life is that it breaks you. And so, man, if you didn't think that, if you thought that shaping was, was, was hard enough and you, the thought of a spiritual surgeon cutting into your life was hard enough, man, I want you to know that, man, when you pray scripture, it's going to break you. There's this analogy used in scripture of the potter and the clay. And in Jeremiah 18, 4, it says this, but the jar he was making, and just think about that the jar is your life, the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. Have you ever been walking through your life and like, man, I, and, and all of a sudden you have this epiphany or this realization, you think to yourself, this didn't turn out how I thought. What happened? God, is, is this what you wanted for my life? And man, if you're asking the question, then chances are that no, that's not God, what God wanted from your life. Because you look at your life and it's broken and it's shattered, pieces all over the place ruin of relationships gone bad and just just stuff baggage look what it says here but the jar he was making didn't turn out as he had hoped so he crushed it into a lump of clay again and started over that sounds really painful that God's going to take your life that didn't turn out like you hoped or he hoped He's going to crush it and start over. But let me tell you the truth this morning. That's the most gracious thing that God could ever do for you is to give you a second chance. That in spite of all that junk, that in spite of all that baggage, he's going to crush it and he's going to start over. He's going to give you a new day and a new start. 
all because of what Jesus did on the cross. Oh, the cross, that song that we sang. Oh, what Jesus did for us. Because of what he did, we can have a second chance. And so you, when you hear the words break you, you're like, oh, that doesn't sound fun when actually, man, it's the best thing that God could ever do for you. In Jeremiah 18, 6, God says, Oh, Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to his clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. So when I heard voice, voices like that, I'm like, God, crush me, break me, shape me. Listen, any position that God has in your life has to include lordship. It has to include surrender to the fact that sometimes he needs to break you a little bit. He needs to crush you a little bit. And why does Jesus get to do that in our lives? Because he got low and he earned it. Because before he breaks you and me, he was broken. Before he breaks you and me, he paid the ultimate price. So that he could be your savior and your Lord. And it's the same with us many times. We get low and we get broken before we rise up into the plan that God has for us. Listen, Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote more of the New Testament than anybody else. He got knocked off his donkey and made blind before he could step up into his God-given destiny. Think about Moses. He spent 40 years in the wilderness. He got low before he rose up as the deliverer of Israel. Think about Joseph. He spent time in jail. He kept getting knocked down over and over and over because before he rose up, he was broken. Think about David. He went on the run as a fugitive for years and years and years. He was broken down to his core before he rose up as king of Israel. Think about John the Baptist. He lived in the wilderness. He ate grasshoppers. He, 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 by the world standards, he was an outcast before he lived out the plan that God has for his life. Every single one of the disciples that followed Jesus gave their life for the gospel, except for John. They were broken. And John was boiled in a vat of oil before he was, he was uh, sent to the island of Patmos to be exiled for the rest of his life. Being broken is a part of following Jesus. And your life probably won't include martyrdom. It pro you probably aren't going to get boiled in a vat of oil. You're probably not going to you know, have some of these horrible things happen to you in life. But getting broken by the hands of a loving father is the best thing that can happen to you and me. Listen, when you see someone else's brokenness, it tends to break you. When my kids get hurt, I feel it. You know, has that ever happened to you? Your kid get hurt and you're like, oh man, I... You have that sympathy pain. Like, I feel it when I see somebody else get hurt or broken. But when you, when you see that someone is broken for you, like Jesus was, it ruins you. When it gets from your head to your heart that Jesus was broken so that I could be free, it, it breaks you, it ruins you, it crushes you in the best way possible. Hebrews 12, 29 says, for our God is a consuming fire. And so I pray that prayer of my life. God, consume every part of me. Consume my whole life. Let all of my desires and everything that I have be pointed towards you. Proverbs 17, 3, it says, fire tests the purity of silver and gold, but the Lord tests the heart. God, test my heart like fire, the refiner's fire. Burn away everything from my life that doesn't please you. Crush me and break me, God. James 4.10, another great prayer to pray. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. God, humble me down into the dust so that I can be lifted up into the plan that you have for me. Shape me, Lord. Purity comes when you pass through the fire. Brokenness comes before wholeness in Christ. And so submit yourself to the Lordship of Christ and let him break you. As my teenage son says when he plays Xbox, he'll be playing and he'll be like, get wrecked. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Get wrecked. And, I mean, and so I got two teenage boys. And so now they walk around the house and they'll, they'll, they'll all spontaneously get wrecked. And so, you know, hey, we could turn that. God, wreck me. Break me in the best way possible. Amen.
Number three, what happens when you pray scripture over your life? The first two are hard. This one should help you. It encourages you. It encourages you when you pray scripture over your life. Man, these next two, point three and four, better get you excited about prayer. I mean, we pray prayers over our life like, like this. In Joshua 1.9, it says, This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord God is with you wherever you go. The Lord God is with you wherever you go. Let's break down this word encourage. A lot of times when we hear, hey, I just need somebody to encourage me. What are we saying? A lot of times when we say, I need somebody to encourage me, we, we're really saying, I want to feel loved. I want to feel validated. I want to feel affirmed. I want somebody to just see the pain that I'm going through in my life. And I just want them to, to, to speak those soft, sweet nothings in my ear. Right? That's what we're really saying a lot of times when we say, I want somebody to encourage me. But the biblical definition of encourage is to put courage in you. To put courage, it's not just about how you feel, it's equipping you to step up and be courageous. To be courageous. And so when we, when we read verses like this, that, you know, when God says, this is my command, be strong and courageous, it's not about what you feel, it's what's real. That the strength and the power of God is available and at your disposal to be used in your life. And so not only do I feel loved and affirmed and validated by God, but he puts strength inside of me so that I'm ready to climb this mountain, to fight this battle, to be the person that he's created me to be. You see, I think that the Bible is the most encouraging book on the planet. Some people, when they look at the Bible, they're not encouraged. They feel condemned. Some people, when they look at scriptures, they see judgment. But listen, when I look at scriptures, I don't, I don't see judgment or condemnation. I see a Savior with arms open wide who offers salvation from judgment. Some people see rules and regulation, and they're not encouraged by God's word. But what I see is a Father giving love and guardrails and wisdom so that we can live pers- purposeful lives. Right? Some people see everything they're not when they read scripture. Are you one of those, you read scripture and you're like, I'll never, I'll never attain to that, I'll never, I'll never get there, I'll never be that good, right? Some people, when they read scripture, that's what they see. But I see everything that I can be through Christ who gives me strength. You see, if, you, if you're, if you're going to be encouraged by scripture, you've got to pray it into your life. You've got to pray it over your life. You've got to know that this is God's love letter to you. And he's writing on these pages through, through those prophets long ago what could be reality in your life. Man, it unlocks so much when you pray scripture into your life. But when it comes to praying scripture into your life, perspective is everything. Perspective is everything. And so if you just have a critical outlook on life, you're never going to be encouraged by Scripture. Listen, being critical is a cheap gift. Anyone can do it. But putting courage and strength into your life through the Word of God takes guts. It takes persistence. It takes an attitude that says, I'm not going to stop. The loudest boos in your life come from the cheapest seats. All those people in your life that aren't invested, that don't care about you, that haven't walked in your shoes, that don't know what you're going through. But Jesus, he knows. The Bible says that he's been tempted in every way just as you are, but was without sin. That he can identify with your sufferings. You see, so if you're going to receive encouragement from anybody, if you're going to receive validation from anybody... Let it be the King of kings and the Lord of the lords that knows you more than you'll ever know yourself. And speak into your life what he says about you. Jesus wants to encourage you through his word. And when you pray his word over your life, you will walk away encouraged if you let him. You'll be walking away into life from God's word being convinced. That no temptation is going to overtake you. Sometimes we walk away from a commitment to God and we're like, I don't know if I could do this. 
But when you pray God's word in your life, you, you, you pray things like 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and you say, man, the temptations in my life are no different than anyone else. And God's faithful. He's not going to allow me, allow the temptation to be more than I can stand. Because when I'm tempted, he's going to show me a way out so that I can endure. Right? I'm going to pray that over my, over my life. When you pray scripture in your life, when you encourage yourself, you're going to know that no condemnation is going to rule your life. Romans 8, 1, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And so if God is not condemning me, I'm not going to condemn myself. But I'm going to encourage myself that God is for me. Are you encouraged yet? You're going to pray things over your life like the rest of Romans chapter 8. And I just want to encourage you to go home and read it for yourself. But in Romans 8, 31 through 39, it says things like this. It says that overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. It says, I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, nor our fears or today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, nothing in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is re revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. you got to pray these verses over your life, but you got to let them put courage in your heart, not just make you feel good. Amen. Number four. The last thing as we close, is, and Kathy, you can come and play for us today. And the whole band, they're going to come and we're going to worship together here in a minute. But the fourth thing that when you pray scripture happens in your life is it equips you. It equips you. And so it shapes us, it breaks us, it encourages us, and it equips us. Hebrews 13, 21, it says, May he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you the power of Christ Jesus, through the power of Christ Jesus, Every good thing that is pleasing to him. Man, what a great prayer to start the day with. God, equip me today. Whatever I face, whatever I'm going to go through, I believe that you're going to equip me, that you're going to produce in me through the power of Christ Jesus every good thing that is pleasing to you. Break it down. Pray it into your life. Maybe you could turn over to Ephesians chapter 6 and pray the armor of God into your life. In Ephesians 6, 11, it says, put on all the armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. Ephesians 6, 11, God, I need to be able to stand firm today. When I see so-and-so, when I finish that project at work, when I am tempted, God, to stay on track with my goals and my plans and my personal development. God, when I lead, I need wisdom. God, I need you to equip me. And your word says, God, that when I put on this armor of faith, God, when I get the word of God down in my heart, God, when I use salvation, the sal when, I, when I keep it ever in front of me, that you're going to equip me for every good thing in my life. So, God, I'm going to keep going after you. I'm going to keep step forward in faith. I'm not going to let fear hold me back. I'm not going to, to not believe that I can do what you've called me to do. Why? Because you said you're going to equip me, God, and so I'm going to keep stepping forward confidently in faith. Amen? This all happens, church, when you take time to be with Jesus. When you say, God, I don't want just religion. I don't want something fake. I want something real. And how do you know when it's real? When people, other people start to see it in you. In Acts 4.13, the disciples, they were coming into conflict, conflict with the world and the religious leaders of their time. And in Acts 14, it says that these people, they recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. It talks about how they were ordinary men. They were just... Like anybody else, they, they didn't have the education, they didn't have the skills, they, did, they, they weren't standouts. They were just people. But you know what they had? They had spent time with Jesus. And because they had spent time with Jesus, they had real faith. They had real confidence. Because God had deposited His Holy Spirit inside of them. 
You see, when you pray the scripture over your life, when you do what God has called you to do, when you step into this confidence that God can give you, other people are going to start to notice that, man, you're not just somebody that goes to church. You're not just somebody that checks it off the calendar. You're not just somebody that, that, that reads the Bible. You're not, you're not even just somebody who prays. But there's something powerful going on in that person's life. Man, my prayer and my, my cry to God is, God, I don't want to just be somebody with an anemic faith. I don't want to pray weak prayers. I don't want to pray prayers that just, I'm just praying because I have to, because I'm supposed to. You know, I'm going through the motions. I'm just saying stuff I memorized because it's just easy. No, God, get your spiritual scalpel out and start going to work in my life. God, start breaking me and reshaping me. God, encourage me. And not, not just making me feel good, but God, give me courage to step out and do what you're calling me to do. Make the hard decisions in my life. God, equip me. You called me to this, so now I'm leaning on you for the wisdom that I need. Amen? Don't quit before he starts equipping you. Don't quit before he starts equipping you. Too many of us quit long before he has a chance to equip us. We don't take advantage of the amazing gift of God's word. Listen, you can't bypass the process, and so don't get discouraged. Don't feel like you don't know enough. Just get in God's word this week. Start with that soap method, one chapter a day, one verse that you're applying to your life. Do it day after day after day, and just see what starts to happen when you start praying scripture into your life. Pray the word. And I just want to encourage you before we sing this song, pray with this attitude. Say, God, I don't want what's comfor comfortable. God, I want what's changing me. God, I don't want what's easy. God, I want what's meaningful. God, I don't want what seems good. God, I want what really is good in my life. God, I don't want to have a form of godliness, but deny its power. God, I want the real thing. I really want to know you, Jesus. God, I want real transformation. God, I want the renewing of my mind. God, I want to be a new creation, just like your scripture says that I can be. God, I want to be more than a conqueror. God, I want to be your masterpiece. I want to complete the good works that you've prepared in advance for me to do. God, I want to hear that scripture that says, well done, your good and faithful servant. Jesus, that's my desire. God, I want the real thing. God, I don't want the label of Christian in my life without le the legitimacy in my heart of being a true follower of Christ. Jesus, I want to fall in love with you. God, I don't want to be that, that, that lukewarm believer that you spit out of your mouth that it talks about in Revelation. You see, God, when God's word gets in your heart, it fuels your prayer life with powerful prayers. I've got to input the word through prayer and study. I've got to ask God, shape me. God, break me. God, encourage me and equip me. God, we want the real thing. The band is going to play this song today, and you can sit, you can stand, you can kneel. But for the next few minutes, take a few moments and, and start to pray scripture into your life. Maybe one of the verses on your notes. Maybe one of the verses you wrote down that were on the screens. Maybe a verse that just pops into your head because maybe that's what God's putting on your heart at this time. But as we sing this song, let's begin to practice and pray the scripture of God into our life. Amen. Thanks for joining us online at Mosaic Church. We hope today's message was life-changing and useful. For more info, visit mosaiccincinnati.com.